All right, so uh, as those of you who read the abstract know, the scheme language is being revised again. This will be the revised, 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 revised report on the algorithmic language scheme, better known as R7RS, or at least shorter known as R7RS. Personally, I happen to think that joke is out of date, but the committee voted otherwise, so we're stuck with it. All right, so. Uh, this is a GPL presentation, so if you decide you like it, uh, you know, you get to steal it with the usual GPL conditions. It will be posted on my website later. Hopefully today, but maybe not. All right. So, for the... What? No, oh, you're not here? No, oh, you're missing my jokes. Uh, yes, I am on. Solid light or... Solid. Oh, uh, you yeah, still not hearing me? No, I'm here. Okay. Okay. Go. Okay, good. Yeah, you're on. All right. All right, well, I've only got one voice, and you all are way out of stereo range. So that's probably good. Okay. So, scheme is one of the four living dialects of Lisp um, for reasonable definitions of living. Uh, we have common Lisp, we have scheme, we have Emacs Lisp, and we have closure. Okay, what makes Scheme different from all other Lisps? What makes this night different from all other nights? Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Here I am. You see better now? Oh, my head's in the way. <laughs> not a win. Yeah, well, it's not just that. It's the way you're all spread out. Well, either that or you could actually move up here. I mean, I'm not going to spit on you, and I'm not your teacher, so I'm not going <laughs> to drill you with questions. That's really kind of silly for... <laughs> yeah, so I say now. I, I may ask questions, but I promise not to drill you with them. I prefer to go on the other side. Well, you will move by. Okay. Sorry about that. The, the video guy wins, and the rest of you must adjust, including me. Different from what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of many differences, I hope. All right. That's a very ominous noise. Don't make that noise. Seems to have stopped. Okay. Well, it's not my laptop, and I have many, I have many uh, hardware backups if it breaks. So I have this thing, uh, and failing that, I have printed the slides and will hold them in the air. Okay. Now I am many slides down from where I should be. So I will attempt to go to slide one, or actually two, and okay, what makes Scheme different? First of all, it has a really tiny stack to core. Uh, there are variables, constants, procedure calls, quote, if, lambda, and set, and that's it. Everything else is done by macro expansion very cleverly. All the Scheme's identifiers are lexically scoped. All implementations must be properly tail recursive. That means when you write a program that's tail recursive, you get to count on it, which means that you write programs differently because you can count on it. It's not just an optimization, and it's not just tail recursion because you can have things like state machine procedures which decide, okay, we're in a certain state, and what are we going to do? We'll invoke a procedure, and that gets compiled as a jump, and that's really nice. First class continuations with call CC. I will not spend the rest of the hour describing first class continuations and call CC. Um, there's a single namespace for procedures and variables. Uh, the numerical tower, which, which has complex at the top and then goes down to real and rational and integer, um, is independent of layout uh, of um, hardware format and is independent of the notion of exactness. So you can have an, an inexact 0.5, which is a float, or you can have an exact 0.5, which is rational number one over exact rational number one over two. Okay, and we have hygienic macros. Again, I will not spend the hour explaining hygienic macros and why they're good, except to say that if you were used to non-hygienic macros, you are basically in the same situation as people who are used to uh, all, all variables being dynamically scoped, and you are paying this, you are taking the same risks and potentially paying the same price. All right, R5RS came out in 1998, the only five times revised version of the standard. 
Um, what happened before that, very briefly, was that the original report on scheme and the revised report on scheme were just um, reports on the scheme implementation embedded on Mac Lisp, written by Guy Steele, and you know that nobody ever thought anyone was going anywhere. But then the revised revised report was written by implementers and basically said, okay, this is what all our implementations are going to have in common. And uh, they bro decided to break with the past. Not entirely, we still have car and cutter and cons, but uh, for example, um, all, all predicates now end with question marks and scheme and all, um, uh, all destructive operations end with exclamation point and the names uh, follow patterns for the most part. Okay, then we had our 3RS and our 4RS and our 5RS and not much changed for a couple of reasons. Implementers were doing it. Implementers are lazy. They don't want to change much. Um, they, they, uh, they had a rule of unanimous agreement. Nothing could be changed unless everybody on the committee at the time agreed unanimously. That meant not much got changed. Uh, so it's a very conservative extension of our 2RS. Uh, in particular, and this is going to be important, Everything in our 5RS is, it is an error if, which means anything can happen. Demons fly out of your nose, your program crashes, um, you know, the, the system does whatever it wants. Most systems are polite enough to catch, uh, the, uh, are to polite enough to throw an exception according to their uh, exception systems, but not all. Okay. Then came our 6RS, came out in 2007 after like four years of working on it. An implementer to driven process still. But they gave up on unanimity, which is probably good because otherwise our 6RS would have come out in 2027. Um, it added the notion of libraries, which are sort of like common list packages, but different. Um, they're a syntactic abstraction rather than something you see at runtime as a rule. Um, and many, many new procedures and syntax forms. The, uh, uh, the R5RS is 50 pages in the PDF. Uh, our 6RS is 90 pages plus another 100 pages for the libraries plus another 20 or 30 pages of, uh, of, um, of non-normative appendices plus another 20 pa 10, 15 pages of rationale. So, a lot. It's a big standard. All these libraries we're talking about are mandatory. It's not as big as common list, but it's a lot bigger than R5RS. They were pretty careful about backward compatibility for code. Uh, most R5RS code works fine. There's even an R5RS compatibility library. Implementations, not so much. It's hard to convert an implementation from R5RS to R6RS. Um, in particular, R6RS demands, you know, dictates in detail what is going to happen when an error occurs. It usually says, and an error of, you know, type syntactic error is thrown in this case. Uh, so there's, like, like common list, but even more so, um, there's a, there are very strong restrictions on, you, you can't use errors as extension points. In R5RS you could always say, okay, this error is an, is an, um, yeah, is unspecified behavior and, you know, we get to do something, we get to do something smart. Uh, R6RS, no. Okay, what the existing e implementations look like. First of all, there are 77 of them on the fairly complete list. Um, you, these are ones that actually have some kind of web presence and something you can download, whether it compiles or not. Um, <laughs> most of them are portable. Most, but not all, are portable to the major, um, the major platforms of today. Uh, here are a very few that are considered serious, maintained with community implementations. Okay, we have some that are just our 6RS, uh, Icarus and Vicare. Those, that, that's a fork. Um, Ypsilon, Iron Scheme, Mosh. Uh, then a few really big ones that, that took the leap and said, okay, in addition to our R5RS support, we're going to add the R6RS support. And, you know, they're going to share as much as they can, but they're really two different things. Uh, and that would be Racket, which used to be called uh, PLT Scheme, uh, Guile, um, uh, Shea Scheme, and Larceny. Okay, and finally, a whole pile of R5RS implementations. People look at it and say, 50 pages, I can do that, and they do. So we get, we get Gauche and MIT Scheme and Gambit and Chicken and Big Lou and Scheme 48 and Kawa and Cisc and SCM and Stacklos and KSI and Chibi. Now, Chibi is the reference implementation for R7RS small. It is tracking 
uh, the R7RS standard. So it's going to be probably the first R7RS system just for that. Why are there so many? Well, some of them are plain interpreters, some of them are bytecode interpreters, some of them are compilers. Um, they have different speeds based safety and standardization trade-offs. Big Lou, for example, grossly violates standardization in a couple of places, but it's fast. Um, Gambit is really fast and doesn't violate anything. Chicken is fast too and it even has a fast compiler and doesn't violate anything. Um, on the other hand, if you, what you need is really, really small space, Chibi is your friend. It is designed for embedding. There are different platforms. Some generate assembly language programs, some generate C, some generate JVM bytecodes, some generate CLR bytecodes. So everybody thinks, and I'm, I'm not even mentioning the ones that are written in Haskell or OCaml <laughs> or Python or Ruby. <laughs> Uh, of course, one of the other one of the other problems with having 77 implementations is most of them are not really finished, and you know, uh, okay, open source code is like that, and, and everybody in the scheme community says, why can't we just get together and work on, you know, one implementation or two implementations, to make them really good? And the answer is, which ones? <laughs> so, R7RS small. It's a conservative extension of R5RS. We started with R5RS and mutated it. Um, it's not as conservative as R5RS was. We've added maybe 50% new identifiers. Um, it's, de it's explicit design points are research, education, scripting languages, and embedded systems. It's intended to be the small language. The steering committee decided that because uh, a lot of implementations didn't go to R6RS, they would split the language in two parts, the, the small language and the big language, and make sure they were compatible. Okay, so the hope is that R7RS is a more effective common core. One of the problems with R5RS is, um, although applications written in an R5RS scheme are pretty portable because the underlying implementation is portable, library programmers have a problem. Their, their stuff is not so portable from one scheme to another. You know, you write a really good um, you know, regular expression library, you have to have all sorts of bags on the side and the scheme analog of if defs in order to make it work on all the big, all the major schemes out there and the minor schemes forget it. Okay, but on the other hand, R7RS keeps the libertarian, um, you, you know, do it however you want, undefined behavior semantics of R5RS. It does not constrain the implementation very much more than R5RS did. I think there are six places in R5RS where the, where the standard says an error must be thrown in this case and maybe um, we've added maybe one or two more. Okay, so what does working group one look like? There are two working groups, one and two. There's a steering committee. Anybody who wanted to and heard about it could vote for members of the steering committee. Um, so we have a, there's a five member steering committee and they steer. And uh, they decided, okay, this is going to be the, the uh, their, their website, by the way, is scheme-reports.org. Uh, and there you can get things like the charters and access to the drafts and so forth and so on. Okay, so it was, the, the people on the working group were self-selected, although the steering committee blessed them. And pretty much there were, uh, you know, a small number of people who, who, you know, were considered to be more trouble than they were worth and a, a number of people who decided to leave on their own accord, but everybody in it is otherwise self-selected. It's a user-driven process. Almost everybody on the committee now is a user. Some of them are implementers too. Um, but it is not unlike the, the previous drafts, implementer-driven. Excuse me, the previous, uh, um, previous reports. Okay, so we have a publicly readable mailing list, we have a publicly readable bug tracker, we have a publicly readable wiki. Okay, so, you know, issues get put on the bug tracker, proposals to solve them get put on the wiki, um, people vote, uh, the ballots get put on the wiki. Um, the, uh, we've gone through four ballot cycles now, and I think that's going to be the last one for a while. Okay, so the, we use the ranked pairs voting system for anybody who cares, because there are frequently three, four, five proposals on the table. Um, I don't know offhand how many how many ballot issues we've had, but I, the total number of issues is like 270, but some of them are editorial. Um, the final committee draft should be out in a few weeks. That'll be the fourth draft. I've written most of it, but 
I need somebody to review it, and the two people who usually review it are, are both uh, swapped right now, or in one case in China. So uh, it's going to wait. Uh, then the steering committee will call, you know, everybody in sight for formal comments, and hopefully we will have a published report sometime this year, with any luck. By the way, if you have questions, wave your hands. I don't, you know, um, there's no need to keep it to the end. Okay, so at that point, I've more or less talked all about generalities and process that I'm going to, and I'm going to talk about what's really new. And we've tried our best to make what's new not all that new. Um, the general view of the working group was standardization isn't the place to innovate stuff. You innovate stuff in implementations, you innovate stuff in code libraries, you innovate stuff wherever you can. If it catches on, you standardize it. Okay, so one thing that was imposed on us by the committee is that you must have some kind of module system. You must have libraries. So we do. Um, it's a purely static facility. You just have files that say uh, define library at the top of them. And we deliberately chose it because of the enters are mildly incompatible with R6RS. The name define library, which is not used by anybody as far as we can figure out, is, is one that we picked. It's not that pretty, but we picked it. Um, people frequently ask me, why did the working group do such and such? The answer is because that's the way the people in it voted. Very rarely were detailed rationales prepared. Sometimes individuals gave their individual rationales about particular votes. But in general, there aren't any consensus rationales because not a consensus operation. Very few, very few um, votes were unanimous votes. Uh, most of them were, you know, pretty, uh, pretty one-sided votes, but they weren't unanimous. There were always people who were against things. And yet we are not, you know, tearing each other's hair out, so that's probably good. Um, so it's an extended subset of what R6RS has. Extended subset is such a nice marketing term, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, here's what library names look like. They look like, they're lists, they look like Scheme Base or Surfy 8 or, or it's Cecil Cowan JSO. That's a little library of my own. Um, the only real conventions here are that if it begins with Scheme or Surfy, it had better be uh, part of a, a report or part of a survey. Surfy is Scheme's uh, request for implementation. It's a series of places where people put um, sometimes implementations, always specifications, and say it would be cool if your Scheme had this too. Um, you get to import libraries into other libraries and into the main program uh, with the import declaration, which you can import the whole library, that's easy, or you can implement only particular identifiers from it or all identifiers except these. So frequently you import, you know, scheme base except plus minus times and divide and then you bring in plus minus times and divide only from some other library and then you've overridden them. Isn't that nice? You can rename them or you can prefix them as you bring them in. Uh, likewise, you get, when you export symbols, you can export them with a different name than you defined them with. Um, how does actual code get into libraries besides just tech? Yeah. Uh, was there a good reason to uh, choose the refixing of the uh, libraries instead of implementing the uh, module system in a, uh, with a uh, first class environment? Um, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, why didn't we use first class environments? Is that a short summary? Uh, because they're a contentious pain in the ass. Um, because we spent about, I don't know, 500 messages talking about first class environments before deciding to stuff them under the rug. Um, they're really hard and it's not clear that it's not clear that any one way of doing them is right. And again, we try not, we not only try not to innovate, we try not to take sides when standardizing. Sometimes we have no choice but to take sides. That's why, they're, that's why we vote, because we have to take sides. But uh, doing it this way is something that could be easily layered over any existing implementation because it's so static. The implementation can take the library file, translate it into first class environments or syntactic modules or whatever the hell it's got, and that just works. Okay. So you can pull in code with include or include case insensitive. Um, Scheme has historically been case insensitive like common lisp. Uh, R6RS and R7RS and most implementations are now case sensitive. They just so, oh well, you know, those aren't compatible with R5RS. We're case, we're case sensitive. Yeah, there's just too much of that around. The, um, 
the horse has already left the barn on that respect. But we thought, okay, you know, there's people like Taylor Campbell who like to write case insensitive code, so we'll give him the include CI and then he can bring his code into the library like that. Uh, you can embed code directly in the module, uh, in the library form with begin, if you want. That's pretty much the only way you can do it in R6RS. R6RS doesn't have built-in include. So uh, we thought, well, okay, we'll let you do that. And then we have cond expand, which is a sort of cond, a syntactic cond. It says, um, if these modules are available, or these features are available, or it's this implementation, you know, and or and not, any of those things, then you can then include this code, otherwise include that. And that's the same for import. You can say, you know, if, if such and such a library exists, then import it. Otherwise, here's my hacked up version of the library. And this is all done by the compiler. Yeah, or whatever passes for the compiler. And interpreters, it's probably done at macro expand time, or maybe before macro expand time, whenever you like. Um, con what cond expand knows about are static properties. It knows, you know, what modules exist, what kind of implementation we are, nothing at runtime. Uh, there are no phasing, for people who know what phasing issues are, there are no phasing issues in R7RS small. Uh, the, 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 reader, the reader learns nothing from, the, from runtime, the macro expander learns nothing from runtime, only runtime knows about runtime. Okay, next big thing we added was define record type. Scheme didn't have any way of doing uh, extensible types until R6RS. Uh, that is to say it did. Essentially all implementations have them and essentially all of them use the, the form define record type. R6RS therefore had define record type and, they, and it was incompatible with the normal way of doing it. So we said, no, we'll make it compatible. So it's the Surfy 9 uh, compatibility approach. Uh, one of the things about it is that unlike, uh, what's it called, make structure, no, define structure, def structure, def struct. Not short enough. I mean, you used a scheme where you have to be verbose. Um, the names of the constructor, the predicate, the accessors, and the mutators have to be spelled out. Uh, and that has to do with hygienic macros. D macros don't introduce any names that, that aren't lexically vis they aren't physically visible in the, in the macro call. Okay. Uh, R7 RS large will have facilities to create records at runtime and to introspect them. Uh, and we'll talk about R7 RS large when we get to the and okay, so what does exception handling look like? Well, in R5 arrest, there wasn't any. Uh, there was error. Um, that made something happen. <laughs> Who knows what? Anyway, we thought that was a little that was a little perverse. And most schemes do have ways of catching errors. So we we kicked around various options, and we just took the R6 arrest error handling system, exception handling system. In other words. Uh, you can use guard, which is, a, is the try, uh, try accept of most modern programming language. Or you can use with exception handler, which uh, allows your exception handler to run in the context of your uh, code. So you can resume it. You know, if you, you fall out of the exception handler, you, you go back to where you were. Um, it doesn't throw, you know, it doesn't. If you want a... a um, that's the word I want, non-local exit. You, make a, you take a non-local exit, which in scheme means call CC. Okay, there's no prescribed condition hierarchy. We didn't write down that there's a, there's a record of type, you know, arithmetic error, and there's a record of type syntax error, and there's a record of type this and type that. R6 RS did that. And then you come at uh, implementations like Chicken, which use Surfy 12, I think it is, exceptions, which are lists with known cars. And they said, well, how are you going to make that fit? And then, uh, oh, well, I guess we aren't. And in the, the result is in Racket, for example, there are, there are the traditional Racket conditions, and then there are the R6RS Racket conditions, and never the twain shall meet. So we said, the hell with this. Any object can be an exception. If your exception is four, hopefully you know what to do with a four when, you, when your exception handler catches it. That's OK. Um, <laughs> all right, parameters. This is a really stupid name, but we're stuck with it. Parameters are dynamic scope for scheme. Uh, the reason they're different is that instead of declaring variables as being dynamically scoped, we have objects that capture the idea of dynamic scopedness. So you start out by assigning a global variable to make parameter 10, which will be its initial value. And now that variable contains a parameter. And when you use parameterize, which looks like let, 
uh, the variables, quote unquote, being bound aren't the variable aren't, aren't being bound at all. What's happening is that the parameter objects are being used. And how do you get what's in a parameter? Well, a parameter is a procedure, so you you call it. That's how you get it. Um, now, in the in the surfy for parameters, you can also mutate a parameter without binding it. And we decided not to support that because it gets real ugly around. Mutate a parameter. Does it affect other threads or not? Yeah. Excuse me. In the sense that you that that the syntax is that of an ex the syntax there is that of an expression, so you know it may be well known at runtime already if it's stashed enough. Is there an analogy to probability? Uh, in general, yeah, but it is. Prog V lets you say which variables you are going to use, but. Yeah, I guess there is, because you can create your own symbols at runtime and then say, okay, these are their, and then bind their dynamic uh, values. But uh, rather than packing it all up into symbols, I mean, there's no real reason in Scheme why identifiers have to be implemented as symbols. We have symbols, but you don't actually have to use them to implement identifiers if you don't want. Most people do want, but that's a choice. Scheme, scheme implementers have lots of choices. Okay, so yeah, parameterize exactly like let syntactically except that if uh, it's not you know if it's not a variable if it's an exp any parameter valued expression that's fine yeah this probably should be deferred or ignored you mentioned the word threat right how's that possible our 7RS can't know about threat right but we do our 7RS uh, yeah. does not discuss threads and so why did I mention threads right. because we know perfectly well that implementations have threads so we make a remark of the form if your implementation has threads, <laughs> and more subtly, uh, some schemes, when you mutate a parameter, as opposed to rebinding it, when you mutate a parameter, that affects all threads that have not bound it. Uh, other schemes, it does not. They, all, they have their own co private copies. So if we say mutability is out of scope, uh, we don't have that problem. Okay, so it, threads are mentioned only in the rationale. Okay, byte vectors. Um, these are the specialized vectors whose elements are bytes. One of the things about Scheme is that its, its basic data types are uh, disjoint. Strings are not vectors. Byte vectors are not vectors. Vec general vectors, that is. There are general vectors, which are called vectors. There are byte vectors. There are strings. They are separate things. Um, so historically, we didn't need byte vectors that much because people used strings because everybody knew that the smallest character had an, had an integer value of zero and the largest character had an integer value of 255. Not anymore. There's a slide on Unicode later. Okay. So now we added byte vectors as a disjoint type with their own lexical syntax. And uh, we let you process them a byte at a time with... Um, with a U8 ref and U8 set, so they they treat them as unsigned unsigned 8-bit integers. Uh, in our 7RS large, we'll have a package for dealing with them as signed bytes or 2-byte uh, ints or 4-byte ints or 16-byte um, double precision complex numbers, uh, whatever you want. Okay, is that right? I think I screwed up. No, that's right. Okay, binary ports. Scheme didn't used to have any kind of binary I.O. at all. We kicked this around, or let's say, our 5RS didn't. Our 6RS did, but at the expense of having two I.O. systems. There was the R5RS compatible I.O. system that everybody knew, and then there was the R6RS all singing, all dancing, nobody had ever heard of it. Nobody had a clue how it was going to be used I.O. system. We decided not to do that. We just cloned the existing uh, character I.O. system and made a bi separate binary I.O. system. So instead of open input file, you have open binary uh, open binary input file. Maybe it's open input binary file. I can't remember. That's annoying. Uh, instead of read char or alongside read char, you have read U8. Uh, you can pull them in one at a time. There's no conversion between these kinds of ports. They're disjoint or at least the standard thinks of them as disjoint. Implementations can implement them as the same thing under the table. That's okay. Um, in particular, that means that standard input, standard output, and standard error are always going to be textual ports. This really irritated our chair, Alex Shen. He said, I want to be able to write cat in scheme. 
uh, we said sorry you can't do that um, we, kicked, we kicked around various alternatives and they were just they were just not beautiful so we didn't do them there's byte IO like this one at a time and then there's byte vector IO you know give me the next 35 bytes as a vector or as a byte vector or write out this byte vector in R7 RS large there will be a unified all singing all dancing port system that hopefully will be uh, better designed than R6 RS's it says here okay as a side effect of this we added some string ports and some byte vector ports so a string port reads from a string instead of a file or writes to a newly created string or reads binary stuff from a, from a byte vector or writes to a newly created byte vector. And again, this is one of those places where everybody did Surfy 6 and then R6 RS came along and did it incompatibly. Uh, we went back to Surfy 6. Um, the nice thing about it is that implementing R7 RS on top of R6 RS should be really easy. There isn't going to be a lot of headache to it. They're just different, slightly different modules. Uh, implementing R7 RS on top of any R5 RS or R6 RS is hopefully easy. The implementers that we've asked to say, well, what do you think, guys? Have uniformly reported, looks okay to me. Uh, one or two raised significant you know, implementation issues, but for the most part, and it's early days, and they haven't read the whole spec, and you, know, you can't expect it. They've said, yeah, okay, why not? This is very different from the response that R6RS got. Where it was never, 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 never. <laughs> Integer division. This is a stupid slide, but I put it in anyway. Uh, Taylor Campbell, who's a schemer, uh, said, you know, integer division in all programming languages really sucks because they have these routines called div and mod and, and modulo and remainder and uh, dividend and what just do they do again? And is it the same in this language as the other language? No. No, it's not. You're absolutely right. Uh, so we decided we were going to standardize not only the floor, ceiling, truncate, and round, which is what Common Lisp has, but also the Euclidean one, which means it's a floor if the denominator is negative and a ceiling if it's positive. I mean, the other way around. Uh, anyway, the result is the remainder is always a positive number between zero and, and one less than the, uh, the, than the divisor. Um, and the centered one, which gives you uh, the divisor divided by two on the positive side and on the negative side. So we have actually six of them. And then you get to return the quotient or the remainder or quotient and remainder as multiple values. So 18 new routines and people say, <laughs> this is supposed to be a small standard, guys. Can't you, can't you hold it down? But hey, the committee voted twice for this, so you know, probably not. Unicode. Unicode is really big and I could spend what's left of the hour talking about it, but it's, there's two things to say about it. That, that became the principles for designing the Unicode stuff. And one was, it's the dominant character standard nowadays. Uh, pretty much everywhere you go, if you encode characters, you encode them in Unicode. Google did a little measure of the web and said, 70% of all web documents are in UTF-8. They don't necessarily say so, but they are. That includes the ones that are in straight ASCII, because straight ASCII is a subset of UTF-8. Another 10 to 15% are in Latin 1, Windows 1252 and variants thereof. Everything else is in the remaining 10 to 15 percent. So yeah, Unicode is, is not only winning, it's won. On the other hand, we didn't want to say to everybody, well, you got to have the whole Unicode, you got to tote the whole Unicode library around with you. How many uh, small and capital letters are there for your upcase and downcase? Well, a lot. You know, maybe like about a thousand? Okay, so embedded systems, no, I don't think so. So the second law was, Implementations don't have to support any particular character. If they do, that's great. If they don't, okay. Similarly, um, as in Common Lisp, we, we imported the Common Lisp notion of string characters versus non-string characters. You don't have to say that all, that all the characters you support go into strings. Lots of people will say, okay, I'll support all the characters because they're just immediates anyway. You can pack them in 24 bits. But uh, I'm not, you know, my, my strings are going to stay 8-bit and they're going to be Latin 1 and that's it. That's okay. Um, we get Unicode casing and normalizing. 
Uh, so you can say, all right, well, if I pass it a Latin lowercase lambda, then and I to, to char, char upcase, then it will become a Latin, uh, sorry, Latin, a Greek capital a capital letter lambda, um, and that's guaranteed provided the implementation actually has both those characters. If it doesn't, all bets are off. We also broke with backward compatibility and said string com string comparison is implementation dependent. The advantage there is we can say, okay, we're going to store, we're Japanese, our, our implementation is in Japanese and we're going to store our strings, you know, in a Japanese encoding and we're going to sort them in binary. And if that's not Unicode, too bad. And so we, we decided to bless this behavior. Um, so string less than means something, but you don't exactly know what it means. Uh, except that one of less than, equal to, or greater than applies between any two strings. Self-consistency. Uh, lists have been around a long time in Lisp. Vectors, not so much. Strings, not so much. Scheme sort of showed the evidence of this. Um, we had make string as the general str the string constructor that says, give me n characters that are all k. And we had make vector that did the same thing, but we didn't have make list. So I was all the time running these little test things and typing in the definition of make list, which gives you a list of length n with with um, all of whose elements are k. So we said, okay, we'll put that in. Likewise, list copy. Likewise, list set. You know, change the nth element of set. You notice how these names are like systematic and pretty looking. They, it's like, oh well, is it nth and is it element or is it, you know, do we want a sequence function or do we want a list specific function and what is it called and what are the order of the arguments? In scheme, they're all the same. They all look the same. Okay, we have, we've had map, which is commonless map car and, and map. Uh, it's commonless map car because it only operates on lists. They said, okay, well, you know, string map, why not? Uh, vector map, that would be a good thing to have. We'll put that in. Uh, similarly for for each, you know, which is the iterator that throws away its, its results. Uh, converters, well, we could convert between lists and strings and strings and, and vectors and lists, but uh, vectors and strings, why don't we allow that? Well, we should. Okay, they're in. So all these things that are in italics are stuff we added under the under the heading of completing the completing the rectangle. A few minor improvements. We standardized how you do IEEE floating point. You don't have to do it if you're running on some cheapo chip that doesn't have IEEE floating point. It's okay. Uh, one of the things in R6RS was you will have all the numeric possibilities, you know, same as common list, but you must have complex numbers, you must have floats, you must have, you know, da 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 da. Um, our 5 rs attitude was, eh, you know, if you don't have complex numbers, fine. If you don't have inexact floats, fine. You know, that we have support for this. And in fact, in R7RS, what we did was put those in modules. So if you don't import the uh, complex library, uh, your implementation is expected to provide the complex library with the complex you know, with the magnitude and, and angle and, and make complex and the complex versions of the floating point um, of, the, of the trigonometric functions and so on, if and only if it actually does complex numbers. Likewise, if it doesn't do inexact numbers and there are schemes around that don't, they just have uh, fixed nums and big nums, then you're not going to have those trigonometric procedures at all because they're in the inexact module. Okay, so, uh, yeah. If there are floating point numbers, are the names of the different types described, like common spells? Scheme doesn't actually have type names. Um, there, in the scheme type predicates, for example, I should explain how they, the numeric tower works in that respect. Number, the, the predicate number, with a question mark at the end, is true of all numbers. The predicate complex is true of all complex numbers. Now, five is a complex number. So it's true of five. Um, likewise, there are real, rational, um, uh, and integer, and exact integer. We have all those predicates. So uh, insofar as there are types, the types are predicates, and yes, they all exist, but they all don't all necessarily mean different things. If your scheme does quaternions, then there will be some that satisfy number and not complex. So uh, that's, how, that's how we do it. Uh, we split apart let rec and let rec star. If somebody wants to look that up, go ahead. I ain't going to explain it. Uh, I barely, my grasp on it is pretty weak. Let rec is more or less uh, F let. 
and let rec star is like f let but different. <laughs> and the, uh, sorry, it's like labels. You're right. The, the difference is not large because um, we don't. I mean, in let rec you can uh, you can define not only functions but also variables because they have they share the same namespace. Um, we ha we added the hash n equals and hash n ash for for uh, um, for uh, writing down recursive stuff and we require you to use it. There's now a write simple procedure which is allowed to loop when it when it finds uh, loop, looping structures and then the normal write is compelled to write them out like this. We added some additional system environment procedures like you know what's the current time and how many jiffies have expired since we started and um, how, to, how to delete files and how to rename them and things like that. Um, and we took a few procedures that we thought needed to be extended and we did them in the Surfy one Surfy one is the big list library written by Alan Shivers and it's everybody uses it so um, we, we there are a few places where we said well I'm going to be gratuitously incompatible with our 5RS and we said Alan you were right <laughs> and we made our 7RS compatible with him okay lexical syntax stuff the hash semicolon which hashes out which comments out the next x expression very nice to have on um, on chicken, the prompts, uh, the REPLs prompts begin with with hash semicolon. It's it's, it's hash semicolon number uh, something else, and then so you you just cut it out and paste it in, and because they're comments, they disappear. It's very nice. Um, this is our block comment style. If I understand you correctly? Yeah. You are going to have syntax inside the comment that is, that's going to determine whether or not it's a comment or not. Sorry? The comments are going to be read and the system is going to decide this is an S, a good, a valid S expression or not. Um, yeah. Even though it's, it's, so the protection of it being a comment is not. It's, it's meant to comment out a, a specific S expression. Yes, but the syntax will be relevant inside the comment. Yes. That's the kind of comment it is. That's a strange comment. No, it's, 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 it's not a, this is not a comment. It's a different syntax. Yeah, it's, it's, it's read suppress mode is what it is. Okay. And that would be the obvious way to implement it. It just, it just, the sequence hash semicolon s expression vanishes. It is not. It is. Yeah, it's read, but it's not processed. Okay. sharp sign, let's say, plus nil in common list. Something like that. Yeah, well, sharp yeah. plus uh, nothing, uh, sorry, sharp plus left parenthesis or right parenthesis. Oh, yeah, same trick. Right, yeah, yeah, that's a nice trick. I didn't know about that one. Okay, these are nestable block comments, which we never had before. We only had semicolon comments before. Uh, these are the syntaxes for infinity, positive infinity, negative infinity, not a number, and negative zero. Um, nobody likes them much, but the R6RS committee put them in. And this is one of the places where the different implementations have been dragged along kicking and screaming because it turns out that C library, that libc does not print the same thing on all platforms by a long shot. So you have to special case all of these things and you might as well do it just one way. Okay. Question about the, um, I'll make it back. Yeah, I'm at. Why do you have like a plus sign in front of it there? Sorry, oh. Uh, well, it, it makes your number parser think it's a number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go, yeah. Um, actually, this is a little messy because it, it used to be that you could tell by the first character if it was a digit, a plus or a minus, you, this had to be a at least potential number and otherwise it wasn't. But it turns out that all schemes actually pretty much do the same thing, namely they look at it and if, if it can be parsed as a number, it's a number, and if not, it's an identifier. So plus 0.0.0, .0 was a perfectly good identifier. <laughs> so we decided to loosen the rule, loosen the official rules and make them a little bit more like the, uh, so uh, th these are the standards. Uh, our strings can now have C style escapes in them, backslash n and all that stuff. Uh, case sensitivity I already talked about. Okay, that concludes the pres part of the presentation that talks about the R7 RS small language, which is what we are working on. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, 
you have a very rough idea if somebody is a reasonably good programmer, starts from scratch, how long it could take to implement this small. What else, sir? What else are you doing at the time? <laughs> <laughs> the I don't know. Um, not starting not from an existing implementation. Uh, Alex Shin wrote, wrote, yeah. Oh, sorry. How long does it take to build an R7 RS small system? It's not that much longer than it takes to build an R5 RS system, and people have done that, you know, in a year in, in spare time. Chibi was built, I think, in about a year. Uh, from in C from scratch, uh, of course, a great deal of it is in scheme um, he, he has some he has some really evil hacks in there, for example, how does he return multiple values? Well, um, multiple values are just a list whose car is a is a distinguished cons that 's all <laughs> that 's perfectly legal in scheme because it 's an error to to uh, to send the, the wrong number of values to something. Instead of, oh, we'll truncate it down to, to just one value or we'll make it into, a, and we'll make it into nil or something. Uh, no, it's an error. So he says, okay, you said, you know, plus uh, values one, two, and it says, meh, plus does not handle lists. <laughs> It's a bytecode interpreter. Oh, okay. okay, it's pretty fast bytecode interpreter. I, I, I believe it's one of the faster bytecode interpreters out there, and it uh, it does the whole language in a relatively um, uh, space sparing way. Again, because it's meant for embedded systems, so or also for for uh, a scripting language. It's intended to displace Tiny Scheme, which is a messy subset of Scheme that has been used a lot as a scripting language. So you see he's going up head to head with that. Question? Oh, I saw one. Okay. Just scratching your head. All right. So R7RS large is large. Um, is large. <laughs> it's going to be really big when it's done. Um, the, it was hard to, uh, everybody who signed up for working group two also signed up for working group one and people don't have that much bandwidth. So we did a few things in working group two and I said, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of it. So I said, I'm just killing myself on this and nobody's paying attention right now. So we're going to wait until working group one shuts down and the steering committee said, okay, fine. So uh, when working group one is done or more or less done, then we'll wake up and, and then we'll have another call for volunteers, you know, to add. New blood, we love new blood. Um, I, I had hoped to get some non-scheme, non-less people, because really what's going on in, in working group two, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm, I hope I will. Really what's going on in working group two is what, what does it mean to have all batteries included? And when I, went, when I went and put together a list of about 250 packages that I thought would be good, you know, I didn't just look at schemes and lists. I looked at, I looked at Python too uh, and a, a bunch of other things. I thought, what, what, is it that, what is it that people nowadays expect? You know, what are they doing? The practical need of modern software developers, you know, what's that? Well, they want to have a lot of stuff around. So we thought, well, what kind of stuff do they actually want? And, I, and then I ran it by the committee and had them voted, vote the packages up or down. And uh, about a, a dozen packages, they said, well, we really should have these, like the foreign function interface, but they're just too big. We're going to be here all decade. So that, that was postponed to the, the mythical working group three, which... <laughs> <laughs> And likewise with things like the window library and you know th th these things have been around for years. I, I think when, I think back in 1984 there was talk of standardizing a common list uh, window library and it didn't happen because everybody thought they'd be there for the next decade and that's exactly what happened. Uh, about a, you know, a decade, decade and a half later they actually had one. Uh, but not of course too late to get into the standard. So we wound up with maybe 80 packages. Uh, and by a package, I mean a library or sometimes two libraries, like the, the floating point uh, package includes not only a floating point library, but a complex number library as well. And in fact, it clones math.h, so, <laughs> you know, that made that uh, math.h and complex.h, and that made that easy to define. Um, okay, so most of them will be optional. So we don't expect, it, to claim compliance with, with R7 or as large, you basically have to say, either I give you the package or I say, I don't have that feature at all. Like for example, most schemes have hash table. 
standards, even though ne they aren't part of R5RS or any early standard. So they say, uh, what we're going to say is, if you have hash tables, you have to provide the hash table package. Uh, if you don't have hash tables, then you don't. And people seem to be able to live with this okay. Um, we may end up requiring a very small number of packages because other packages conspicuously depend on them. I, I don't know right now which those are going to be. The result will be bigger than common Lisp. Does that mean that the uh, specification will be more than 900 Well, I don't know. I may not be that specific in my specifications. <laughs> um, yeah. One of the, re the, the reason why this seems doable, at least to the people who have thought about it, is that um, because we have these library renaming and you know importing just this and importing just that, um, what's really critical is that we get the function right, that we have the right functions and we have the right procedures and the right macros in the library to do what's wanted. If they don't happen to be named what you want, you know, then then write another little library that does nothing but import the the standard library. If they don't have to have the arguments in the order you want, write another little library that adds a few that it imports most of the standard library and has a, and exports everything except the few procedures that have been reordered by you. Um, so the really important that again, that's why I say it's not so important to be a Lisper to work on this because what's really important is that we have the right set of function points, um, big enough, you know. So yeah, I mean, we'll write it down, you know, it, it, won't be as comp it won't be as dense as the hyperspec, it's just going to say this and that, this and that. Um, you know, and just uh, hopefully not more than a paragraph per, per function point. Uh, most, of them, most of the libraries turn out to be just procedural. There are, there's going to be a small number of macros in them, but not huge. Um, Okay, so how's working group two going to work? I actually talked about most of this before. So what we have is we have that selection of packages step done, and we have a certain number of proposals already written. In some cases, like people said, okay, the Surfy one list library, that's going to be a package, as is unchanged. So there's nothing to write. Um, and so I put it on, the, on the, what I call the consent docket, which is a list of things that we aren't even going to vote on unless someone complains. Uh, lots of organizations have consent dockets for, for minor motions, and that's exactly what we're going to do. And then there's a standard docket where we vote on things where there's actually different possibilities. Are we going to do, are we going to do surfy hash tables, or are we going to do um, common list hash tables, or are we going to do uh, our 6 rs hash tables, or are we going to do John Cowan's cleverly, cleverly designed hash table package that can be implemented on top of any of them? Well, we'll see. Okay, um, new members, yeah. So I, I sort of stopped when I was writing the, the uh, multi-dimensional arrays package. I was cloning, cloning APL there. And I thought, uh, okay, I'm tired of this right now. <laughs> so, and then here's the packages that we've, that we've, or some of the packages we've actually voted on. Um, so these are going to be in the standard in one way or another. Some will be very small, like getopt. I mean, what, what's there to say about getopt? You have one or two entry points and that's it. A getopt entry point and an args fold entry point. Um, pattern matching will probably just have match lambda and that's all. Um, I don't think I mentioned case lambda. Case lambda is a very schemey thing that we voted in. There was some controversy about it. The idea is you have multiple bodies with different numbers of arguments. And it's a way, it's a different way of packaging, um, packaging all, um, optional arguments. They don't have to be at the tail. You can say, okay, um, one body is, has an argument X and the other body has an argument Y, X, and it invokes, uh, it, it, it tail calls the other version of it. And your, your unreasonably smart compiler can figure out that we're tail calling ourselves and make that right. Jay, are you, oh, you're just no, looking I, at I, it? I, okay, I, yeah, I know it's hard to see. I've got too many questions. Okay. So the case lambda is like uh, what closure has? Um, I don't know if it does. Uh, multiple bodies through the same lambda with the different Yes, exactly right. Uh, he asked if that was the same as what closure has, multiple bodies, different arity, and the answer is yes. Uh, the people who like it think it's a sweet spot between the full keywords and optional arguments stuff in Common Lisp, which some schemes do have, and um, and doing everything with only the rest parameter and parsing it yourself and usually using a, a too stupid parser that... <laughs>
uh, that doesn't print it, it prints annoyingly irritating and stupid error messages when you've done something there's, unexpected. There's, there's a lot of stuff to argue about. Yeah. And, and you mentioned it wakes up. The right, 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 right. Okay. Um, I, I, I hope you'll join the working group. <laughs> Why not? Well, I'm, I'm actually lying. I think I'm incredibly competent. But <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be too busy. Yes. I, everyone, everyone says they're too busy, but no one has to do a fixed amount. If everybody does something, you know, then, then with a few, a few people to push it through, which we're going to have, um, hopefully it will actually deliver. I, I have a few questions. Yes. No, did we pull multiple values out of out of the smallest? No, we didn't. Uh, the, the main reason we have it is that there's you can't do multiple value call in Scheme. Um, so I thought, well, that's a cool thing to have. We'll have that. You 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 can call you can call a the, the way multi, the, 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 its equivalent is call with values, which invokes um, a thunk which returns some values, and that was which is called the producer. And then a second argument, which is another procedure that gets past all those values. I'll just do one more. Yeah. Threads. Whoa. Right. There is a surfy for threads. Thank heavens. I don't have. We don't have to hack it from the beginning. And one, and one more. Yes. As many as you Whatever want. Happened to my beloved slip? Not mine. Right. Well, I did. I did look at SLIB when I S SLIB is a fairly standard scheme library. Um, I have talked with Aubrey Jaffer. Uh, he he doesn't see any reason why SLIB can't be ported to um, can't be ported to uh, R7 RS small. Um, various features that would make that difficult are are being weeded out of the code even as we speak. So, does generalized set bang means uh, places? Yeah, it's the scheme approach to those is simpler than the common list approach. Basically, there's a for every for every for every function there may be an associated setter, and that's basically all you get. So it's it's a simple case. It's the def setf case. No defined set of standards. Uh, right. Um, if somebody wants those things and and can argue the committee into, and can write a, a coherent spec and argue the committee into putting them in, because fine. <laughs> No, uh, right. It, uh, it would it would indeed have a hash set because we uh, we don't want these packages to depend on each other that much. And when we can't avoid it, maybe we'll do it. Um, What's the difference between pattern matching and regex in this definition? Oh, pattern matching is is oh, list no. level. Oh, what's the difference between the pattern matching package and the regex package? Pattern matching is list level pattern matching, um, uh, a destructuring bind. But the only two that I yeah. Well, if you load that package, yeah. <laughs> now, now, in some cases, these packages will be um, will actually load scheme code. In other cases, they won't. I mean, there's, or they may, but they'll also have to be underlying stuff. So, if you implement the TCP package, for example, um, so you, the, from the user point of view, it'll just say import scheme TCP, and that's fine, or scheme networks TCP, whatever it's going to be called. Um, However, there will obviously have to be underlying stuff in the implementation language. There's no way to do TCP in terms of the small, the small language. Whereas, it's perfectly possible to do the bitwise operations in the small language, and that's maybe even recommended. You know, are you even thinking about having a standard package for database access? Standard package for database access. Which database? Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I believe that was one of the ones that got voted down. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we voted down more than we kept, uh, again, because we thought they weren't right for standardization. There were too many complications. Some of, some of the ones I really loved, like the relational algebra, the, the relational algebra expression to SQL translator, uh, that got voted down. Um, a whole bunch of them, you know, that, that's what happens when you, when you run things openly and democratically. People vote down your little pet projects. Um, uh, and another question, uh, anything in the direction of a build facility or whatever the question of work for that is? Build facilities, yeah. Um, Alex Chin, in addition to his, uh, in addition to his working group, one hat has another hat where he wants to be the, um, 
he wants to be the quick scheme guy. Um, I don't know whether that'll fly. It would be really nice if it did. Uh, most schemes have build facilities. They have, they have their own itty bitty package managers. Um, getting, getting enough, as I explained before, getting enough portability out of our six R5 RS libraries is hard uh, because the, the common core you can count on is too primitive. You don't even have extensible type system. Um, you know, record structures, what have you. So hopefully it will become easier. We don't know exactly what that will mean. Uh, not everything gets standardized. Lots of things won't be in the standard. Um, but these will. These will unless, you know, the committee looks at them and says, we can't make, you know, we can't, we can't resolve to a, a satisfactory conclusion. Um, you know, I hope that won't happen, but anything's possible. Question, yeah. When you say the formats, do you mean some really unpleasant and shameful to own up to embedded language? <laughs> Embedded language, yes, shameful and, and, and hard to, uh, formatting. Uh, shameful and, and hard to own up to, I hope not. Um, basically what they are is format combinators. They're the output analog of parser combinators. And there's a library out there for that that we hope to just scoop up. Will it include the Latin and Akkadian as a common list? <laughs> <laughs> Will it include Latin and Akkadian? Yes. <laughs> and, cl and Klingon too. <laughs> Question, yes. When you talk dates and times, do you end up taking stances on the existence of leap seconds? And yeah, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to, yeah, uh, date and time, do we, what, what's our view on leap seconds? Um, much against my will, WG1 voted for TAI time. Yay! Is that the one with leap seconds? That is, that is the one that just ticks. Just ticks and the leap seconds get put in by the International Committee of Leap Seconds and the thing keeps on ticking. Yes, TAI is, is an atomic clock standard, so it starts at a certain moment and it, it just ticks after that. Every time a certain number of vibrations of cesium pass, right. Right. TAI advances one second. Okay. Right. And but UGC doesn't necessarily because... It's part of it. Yeah. If you record timestamps for events, right. then you've got the guarantee if you're recording seconds, that they will be monotonically increasing over time. Yeah. The and trouble with TAI, of course, is that the trouble with TAI is that we all set our clocks in UTC. And unless we have the UTC TAI table lying about, which it's not so bad. It's, it's not so bad. It's not so bad just to have the table. To update the table may be a pain. That's okay. So that's the way I, I wanted to have POSIX time, uh, which does not account for leap seconds. Uh, the committee, the committee rebelled. They said, no, 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 no. We're going to have TAI time. TAI time is also kind of irrelevantly 10 seconds off from, from UTC time. That it, it's like a different epoch. So, anyway, so there'll be that. There'll be there'll be things for converting those those uh, those magic numbers to. Um, oh, by the way, they will be flow nums, not fixed nums. And the reason for that is if they wouldn't be fixed nums, they'd be big nums by now. And uh, the downside of using flow nums, which I pointed out, but again, they didn't listen. Well, that was a mistake. Is going to let me go back? Yes, it is. Um, let me just put this down. I don't click it by mistake. Uh, the disadvantage of using flow nums is that it allows for lots of precision around the beginning of 1970. <laughs> The, the problem with using flow nums is that you get very, very precise time values around the beginning of 1970. As you get further and further away from 1970, they get less and less precise. Now granted, uh, double precision floating point numbers go, double precision floating point integers go up to 2 to the 53rd power, which is a lot. So for a long time, we don't really have to worry about it. But if you want, you know, if you want to, to clock stuff in nanoseconds, and you're using floating point numbers, you're eventually going to run out of precision because you're using too many digits for size. But, you know, that's the way we're doing it. It's better than allocating big nums all the time. Well, if somebody wants that kind of precision, they'll probably have a special purpose library. Yes, people who want high precision time libraries will have them. But there will be packages that, can, that understand about the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar and the Buddhist calendar and the Hebrew calendar and the Chinese lunar calendar and other things, at least potentially understand about them. Uh, I'm cloning most of that from Java. Um, so then, 
and, and it will let you do things like format times in, in all sorts of ways and international, internationalize the names of the months and allow for the fact that on some calendars there are, 12, there are 13 months in some years and stuff like that. So yeah, more questions about this stuff. Yeah, in the back. What, if anything, is Arsene and Large going to say in terms of more normative error conditions? I don't know. That's a completely open... Oh, what is, what is R7RS going to say about more normative error conditions? Probably, my guess is, I really don't know, but my guess is that for the core it will say nothing and the packages will provide um, their own condition types and expect you to throw them. Is that it would be spread out sort of over packages? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what I think. I would recommend that if you write a package for the small, if you write a library for the small language, that you invent your own condition types and use them, rather than 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 hoping there will be standard condition types around. Um, there is the standard condition type, which is error, with its you know what the error message and the things being complained about. But there isn't even a constructor for that. There's only ways of taking it apart, so that you know you can find out the error message and translate it into Klingon if you want. Yes. Is there a notion of an error category hierarchy? And no. Are available error types discoverable? No. Is there a notion of an error category hierarchy? No. Are error types discoverable? No. Um, that's what we didn't do in in uh, in R7RS. One of the reasons there's no category hierarchy is that there's no type hierarchy in R7RS. There is no way to there are no way to declare subtypes. Um, we will see that surely in the large language. Um, let's see, behind you in the black t-shirt. That was you. You raised your hand earlier? No? Okay. Yes? If it's very detailed, how about logical topics or something like that? Yeah, that didn't, that didn't make it into this frame, but yes, I'm, I'm putting together a path name library that's also a URI library. It is on the list. Um, the inelasticity of typeface prevented me from listing it. Um, yes. Oh, the idea there is that if you were dealing with a pure function, one whose results depend, whose, whose values depend only on its arguments, you can put a bag on the side which contains, you know, n well-known responses to certain arguments. And you can wrap your fun using a memoize, you can wrap your function in this and say, okay, now when I call it, it'll always remember what it has returned before and, and pull it out of the bag. And by mailboxes, do you mean agents like termite scheme? Yes, by, what do I mean by mailboxes? By mailboxes, I mean, I mean queues um, that, that are the thread safe queues. Um, I would like it if there weren't mutexes and condition variables. I think mutexes and condition variables are so low level and, and suck horribly. I would like it if people wrote shared nothing code with mailboxes and queues. Um, I hope they do. But the committee decided that mutexes and condition variables were all over the place in scheme already and we were going to have them, so I said, yes? By the time this gets done, maybe there's that nice table for the tutorial closure. This is what I think regs, mutexes, and conditions. There's a sort of table of basic little things that sort of help handle that. And, you know, I was looking at that figure. Excuse me, that should be in more programming systems. Yeah, you mentioned enclosures, little table of, of primitive, primitive concurrency yeah, right. objects. Little things for handling concurrency. Right. right. Um, and it would be good to have one of those. I tend to agree. Um, I am not now signing up to write tutorial for all this stuff. <laughs> Questions? What, you all know everything? Well, I mean, yes? I mean, this is not a question. Okay. Suggestions. Right, Three suggestions. suggestions. Three suggestions. SXML. Yes. Which I used for the first time, literally in A. Right. Um, and and uh, I think that's great. That'll be in there, don't worry. Because it already exists as a slip thing. And Right, okay, let me, let me stop you. SXML, why is it on this list? Uh, because the committee voted it down. 
I believe the committee voted it down because they didn't like the API. I personally think that was a mistake, that we could have fixed the API and kept the library. Right. But then the argument is, well, that, the result of that is that all the existing XML code becomes incompatible. So XS, X, SXML and SXPath and all these other XML-E things are not getting into the standard today. I will not kill today. Right. <laughs> and then my two, two other suggestions are, yes. of course, um, basic. There should be a basic syntax translator to, uh, you know, to, oh, make, to allow you to write basic. I mean, right. Basic a la QB45, which I've actually written. Okay, Jay wants and, there to, the snowball. It wants there to be wants there to be basic and snowball front ends. Okay, in Chibi, uh, if if everything goes well, there will be I think five front ends. There will be the scheme front end, which we already have. There will be the Lua front end, which, which I think is very nice. Um, there will be the um, there will be the Go front end. Um, well, <laughs> some people do. There will be the. With the language, this is a very an infinite board. <laughs> this is not the, by go I do not mean the infinite board, nor, nor do I mean the monopoly square. <laughs> okay, um, then, uh, sorry. <laughs> Wait, I'm not, I'm not done, yes. Scheme, Lua, and Go. Scheme, Lua, Go, JavaScript, and Bash. And Bash. My doctor's told me not to come to this <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so, yeah. If, if he, those, he says those are the ones he's interested in in no particular order. I asked him if he would do eLisp, and he said he probably would not. On the other hand, Guile does do eLisp and, and has that today. Um, it has to. It has to. It yeah. has to be the standard. Yes, Guile, Guile hopes to be the drop in replacement for the existing eLisp implementation one day. Um, that I, I think that's a cool thing. It, it means, by the way, that there are now, there, that, that there's, there's hash T, which is how you spell true in scheme, and hash F, which is how you spell false. And then there's hash, and in Guile, there's also hash nil, um, which has the property that, that it answers true to the null predicate. <laughs> it answers, it, 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 it works like false. And, um, Look, the answer is true to the null predicate. It works like false, and it answers true to the symbol predicate. Um, and then, yes. So, so an, an, an so an e um, an an e list list will appear. An e list list will appear to scheme as an improper list whose final element is hash nil, but it will. But that's okay because in Guile it will it will answer true to null, so you will get the, the right behavior. Um, it is beautiful. It's it's beautiful in an incredibly ugly way. <laughs> okay. Yes, this is the Chihuahua with the uh, tongue hanging out of its mouth at the ugly dog contest. But it's a beautiful ugly dog. <laughs> okay. Yes. Excuse me, you mentioned the bash front end. Would, would that be a bash which would be extensible with scheme procedures? I have no idea. I, I think what he wants to do is just make bash stuff run quicker. Um, I don't really know the answer. Uh, is, is this a, will this bash interoperate with scheme in any way? And the answer is I have no idea. Um, I would assume that the, well, one of my pet projects, which I hope to get to someday, is a, is a, is a shell which is, which is like RC, the Plan 9 shell, very nice, small, simple shell, and uh, and also does, but is actually written in Lua as a front is is a is a front end to the Lua system, uh, and the nice thing about that is it can be made really small. The art of shell programming, in my opinion, is dying out, and one of the reasons dying out is that Bash sucks, and by having a better shell, which lets you do all the little shelly things, but has like a real programming language behind. Very nice. Maybe it'll actually. Maybe that'll actually spur a revival of some sort. Because there's there, the the beauty of large grained data flow languages. You know, is that's that's what the that's what shell pipelines are. They're large grained data flow languages, and they then they they are for the win. Okay. Have you seen ES? Have I seen ES? Yes. Uh, do I feel like hacking on ES? No. <laughs> yeah, but maybe that's another candidate. 
Yes, I, I, I don't want to try to translate ES to Lua or, or Scheme, but translating a subset of RC to Scheme seems quite plausible. And I, I thought about, you know, what, what that means to be, to be falsy at the, at the scheme, at the, you know, I mean, to, to be falsy is a, at, the, at a shell is for your process to return zero. So that means that, uh, but what if it's not a process? What if it's just a Lua data, a Lua data structure? Um, it means for at least one of the commands in the pipeline to return false. I think that depends on which shell you have. I don't remember what the POSIX answer is. Are you sure? RC got it right. Okay. Born shell got it hideously wrong. Yeah. And bash made it switchable at runtime so that it can always be wrong. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, um, bash. Uh, so, so in, in, in summary, RC is, is correct about uh, falsiness in, the, in shells. Uh, bash, uh, uh, the, the born shell is incorrect, and, um, and bash is ACDC. Uh, more questions? Dead silence. Thank you all. Um, I have never been afraid of talks ever since I gave one 25 years ago in Orlando. I w it was at a, Xerox, um, at a Xerox users group meeting. And all the other talks have been, well, we really think that Xerox products should, uh, not copiers, but computers in those days. We really think that your software should do this and it should do that. You know, and can you please put these things on the list? And I was there saying, here we have this, I, I've actually written open source, I use the word then because it wasn't out. I, I've written open source software and, and if you want you can come up and get it on a, on a floppy. Uh, you know, and they said, well what about support? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm not promising to support it, I don't work for Xerox, but on the other hand, the program is actually here now, you don't have to wait like three years for Xerox to prioritize and implement. And they applauded and they cheered and they got up and they stomped and ever since then I felt good about making talks. <laughs> so on that note,